So welcome to the Desiderata Extinction Party. Uh, we have a special guest today, Dmitry Orlov. And I'm going to keep the introduction really light because I think everybody who watches this already knows who you are, Dmitry. And um, so just briefly, in case some, there's somebody out there that doesn't uh, know who you are, uh, you're an author and um, a Russian-American. You were born in St. Petersburg uh, back when it was Leningrad. Um, and uh, you've lived in America, I think, since about when you were 12. And you came back to the Soviet Union often enough so you could see it collapse. Um, then in uh, 2008, I think, you um, wrote uh, something which was quite groundbreaking. I think it was Rethinking Collapse or Reinventing Collapse. Is that right? And uh, now you're... Uh, you do a lot of blogging. I think you're um, on Club Olov at blogspot.com. And your latest book is called The Arctic Fox Cometh. And uh, just so you don't have to explain that, I'll, I'll explain that to people. It's basically a bit of doggerel from Russian. It's basically a kind of um, obscenity, a Russian obscenity, which basically translates into English as WASF. Is, is that right? Pretty much. Okay, so before we get onto that, um, I you can see that basically I'm doing sea studying, and my background is quite similar to yours. Uh, you were in software and linguistics, um, so I want to talk to you about boats first, if you don't mind. Oh sure. Um, and so yeah, so my take on it was this was my prepping strategy, and it turned out pretty good, especially with COVID and the pandemic. Um, because I, uh, my philosophy was that, you know, living through um, <clears throat> almost collapse in South Africa, right to the brink of a really bad collapse, um, I came to the conclusion that you don't really know how collapse unfolds. You can tell that it's probably going to happen, but in detail, you don't really know, and it happens differently in different places. So I figured you probably, you know, should be mobile, and a boat is a good way of being mobile. So, yeah, I've been sea studying since 2016 and I know you did something similar so can, can you tell us about that and why you've left sea studying and you're homesteading now in Russia? Oh well that's pretty simple the reason I uh, moved on to a boat my wife and I moved on to a boat and sailed off was because I discovered uh, that uh, uh, it wasn't really possible to to do what I wanted to do which was blog and write while keeping a place on land where we were living at the time, which was Boston. Um, but boats offer, uh, well, I don't know about now, but at the time they offered a major loophole, uh, which is uh, boats are discovered, uh, are, are considered as a, as a, a, a luxury item uh, and are not uh, uh, taxed and regulated to the same extent as shoreside dwellings. So this was a life hack, uh, basically to avoid paying rent. You know, the, a little bit of rent towards the marina is is much less than you would pay for a studio apartment in Boston. Um, and then we discovered that you know the boat also offered us a a, a really good chance to avoid uh, the New England winters, which we didn't really like. Um, so then our plan became spend winters aboard in South Carolina and spent summers on land in Russia. And that went on for a while. And then it was time for my son to go to school. And I discovered that uh, uh, public education in, in North America um, is, is horrific. Uh, whereas in Russia, it's, it's really excellent. So we opted to, um, to move to Russia and send our son to school here in Russia. And that is working out uh, quite well. We're very satisfied with it. But uh, the boat sort of thing sort of fell by the wayside because uh, the same amount of money that uh, pays rent on a, on a studio apartment in the States, in Russia, gets you a, a three bedroom in the city and a house in the country and a car to go between them for the same amount of money uh, because the Russians aren't very big on fleecing each other. Um, they're more into making things affordable. So that's worked out pretty well for us. And, and uh, you know, that's where it stands now.
Would you go back to C at all? Would you go back to C? Would you have you given that idea up for good, or do you still hanker after? The well, you know, sailing in Russia is something you can do for about two, two, two and a half months out can of the me? year. So, um, Oops. do you want to ask a question again? Because you broke up a little bit. Uh, yes, I uh, see. I did. No, I was just asking if you hanker to go back to the sea life, and have you given up on that at all? Totally. Well, no, I did it for 10 years. Um, now I might uh, enjoy a day on the water, but living living oh. on a boat uh, is not quite as nice as living in a house on land with uh, all the all the surrounding landscape uh, you can you can claim for any sort of use, which is the situation here. Hello. Okay. While while he was having problems, I I I'm living in a in a little house that I built myself, and I'm growing my vegetables, and I live near the sea, and I, I I I decided to do that about thirty years ago, and so far it's turned out quite well, you know. But I'm in a very isolated place, so um, you know, very very hardly anybody living here. Are you back with us? Are you back with us, Hugh? Because there seems to be a problem with your bandwidth. Are you back? Maybe you want to switch to. Yeah, you're back. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm having uh, major problems with uh, bandwidth for some reason. Well, to, to add to the seasteading, say seasteading saga a little bit, uh, I. I'd like to elaborate on that a little more. Um, to begin with, I, uh, I, I lucked out and bought a, a, a homemade boat made by a, a, a visionary of sorts, a seasteading visionary by the name of Chris Morajan. It was a, a fiberglass over plywood boat, very simple, very robustly built. Um, uh, just to give you an idea, I ran it aground uh, on countless occasions with no damage. Uh, that gives you an idea of the sort of boat it is. Um, and um, didn't manage to wreck it at all, hardly. Um, it's still out there, probably sailing around. Um, but then after our son was born, uh, I needed a bigger boat, so I, I bought a commercial, commercial built yacht. Um, and that was a complete disaster. And that led me to just a complete realization of the fact that seasteading on a commercially built pleasure craft is a completely ridiculous notion because you basically need an entire support train of, of every type of technical service to keep the damn thing afloat. And it eats up a ton of money and it's just completely ridiculous. And along the way, I tried to basically make up for all of the shortcomings of the boat I was living on and sailing around on by conceiving of a boat that will actually made a good seasteading uh, platform called Quidnon. And uh, I worked on it with some other people. There, there was quite a bit of interest in it, but uh, really not enough, um, not enough uh, interest to actually make a go of it because, um, you know, there's, there's really a disconnect. There's, some people are creative and some people have money and, and the two do not cross paths. So um, a lot of people came up with a, a lot of wonderful ideas and then all the people with money just go out and buy their expensive toy. And that's the end of the story. So that's where that ended up. Yeah, there's a community that I've, uh, of kind of retrogade sailors that I, I want to kind of emulate and they guys who, you're trying to go backwards in time and craft things out of wood and you know, get more self-sufficient and you know, stop using so much epoxy and electronics. But commercial boats now are just basically, they're like Teslas on, on the water. They're, they're, most of them are not really even sailable. They, they're just basically houseboats um, just for landlubbers. <laughs> so, but th there is a co kind of breakaway community of doomers that are trying to um, you know, kind of get back to sail. We're kind of like back to the land. It's kind of 
back to sale kind of thing. And I want to head in that direction, but yeah, otherwise I think you, you're probably spot on. So what's, what's your take on, on, you don't deny the climate science in that, but you, you did, uh, I mean, one of the chapters I think in your latest book is um, the global warming apocalyptic cult, which I think I agree with uh, with you that it is a cult, but you're, you're not talking about global warming and the, the climate science. You're really talking about, um, you know, bright green lies and Derek Jensen's take on it, aren't you? The, the basically this industry that's uh, really all about ESG and investing in green tech, and it's it's ludicrous. It's not going to save anybody. It's not going to save this technical civilization, and it's not going to do much for the environment either. Is is that a correct take, or, or what's your feeling? Well, uh, living in the U.S., I, I was sort of uh, uh, bound up in the groupthink that basically cancels anyone who so much as uh, voices a contrary opinion to what these, you know, climate models supposedly show. And then I moved to Russia and discovered that uh, most Russians think that the whole thing is a complete scam, um, that there's no really no such thing as climate science because none of these hypotheses, such as the effect of CO2, uh, have been proven yet. We have to wait a few thousand years the climate is a system with incredible inertia and a lot of noise. So, um, so that that is uh, one point that I that I took home is you know in in the U.S. you show up at a cocktail party and you say something negative about climate science and suddenly you're an uh, an outcast. And in Russia you show up at a cocktail party and and start talking up this uh, Western notion that it's all going to end because of cow farts. And people just think you're insane. You know, they, they just think that you've completely lost it. You got, you got stuff on the brain that shouldn't be there. Um, and, and so these are two, two uh, opposing views on the same topic, both of which have to be considered because it's not like the Russians are just going to quietly go along with something they don't believe in. Forget that. Um, Say probably the same thing with the Indians or the Chinese or, or most of the other countries that are not really uh, bound up in the, in the Western mind think, uh, group think that, that is going on. And then I discovered interesting pockets of uh, research completely unpublicized in the West because of course this stuff gets you banned, but it turns out that the oceans have been warming throughout their entire depth, which cannot have have anything to do with the atmosphere because if, if you look at um, you know the uh, the thermal capacitance of the atmosphere compared to the thermal capacitance of of the oceans, they just don't compare at all. At orders of magnitude different, and um, and so this this has to do with uh, activity at the the core of the Earth. As you know, probably the 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 entire Earth is a molten ball of of material, some of it radioactive and decaying, and radioactive decay produces a great deal of uh, heat. And sometimes the reactor kicks up a notch and sometimes not. And right now, apparently for the past, right now meaning the past few decades, maybe a century or so, um, it has uh, gone on a bit of an uptick. And and so the the the, the ocean throughout its depth has, has uh, Warmed up, warmed up by a degree or two, which causes carbon dioxide to percolate out of the water just the way uh, it does out of a glass of beer if you take it out of the fridge and put it on the, on the kitchen table. And that accounts for a lot of the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Then I, I looked at some other uh, 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 calculations that tried to uh, figure out when the next ice age is going to be. Uh, the Earth is in a sequence of ice ages. Turns out that no human activity can actually break it out of that cycle. And the next ice age could happen. Uh, ice ages are usually preceded by an episode of warming. That is not untypical for ice ages. And some brave people calculated that we have to triple the amount of fossil fuels we burn in order to postpone the next ice age 
by any appreciable amount. Unfortunately, that is three times the amount of fossil fuels that is currently available, so that's not going to happen. Um, so looks like we're in for a warm spell followed by an ice age. You know, if, if you had to put money on it long term, that's probably what's going to happen. So um, you don't think that human activity is actually altering the weather appreciably since, uh, since the Industrial Revolution? I don't think we can tell. I, don't, I, I think we'll, we'll know in a few centuries, maybe, if we keep compiling the numbers. Yeah. But all of this remote sensing stuff, all of this fancy technology that, allow, that allows us to, to say that you know, something is, is changing a tiny bit, um, you know, it's 50 years old or so, uh, at most. Before that, we have various indirect ways of acquiring data. And uh, it all hinges on uh, computer models, computer simulations. Now, I can talk about computer simulations all you want because I worked in high energy physics, which is all based on Monte Carlo uh, simulations mm -hmm. Uh, on supercomputers mm -hmm. to, to calculate what might happen in, in a particle detector under various conditions. And um, computer models are wonderfully easy to fudge. In fact, they're impossible yeah. to not fudge. It's their nature. So any kind of a computer model of, of a, a system like the climate has lots and lots and lots of knobs that are delicately set to please the people who are paying for the simulation. And if these people want to see climate change, sure enough, these climate models will show catastrophic climate change. And if these computer models are being paid to show that the human behavior is having uh, extreme effects on the weather, that's what they're going to try to convince people is happening. Uh, no doubt about it. As far as why are these people paying for it? Well, it's pretty easy that they running, they're running out of things to tax. They no longer make enough stuff for the world to export. Uh, the world has found out how to, how to make stuff on its own very well. Thank you very much. Um, they, they no longer control enough of it um, because basically if you look at uh, the, the growth centers, they're all outside of this, uh, uh, this Western realm. Um, so basically, they're going to try to tax the air you breathe. They've run out of th other things to tax. Why is that not going to work? Well, lots of reasons. This is not a system that you can introduce quickly, and they're out of time. They don't have two, three decades to make sure that everyone is, is slowly made comfortable, you know, thinking that they have to pay for, uh, for, the, for, the, uh, for the carbon dioxide they emit. Uh, that's just not going to happen. And to get two decades from now, their voice won't be heard in the world. So uh, two decades from now because of peak oil, uh, running out of cheap energy or what? Uh, cheap energy has a lot to do with it. Uh, suicidal tendencies have a lot to do with it too. Um, I, I think you have to look at a, a mixture of the two. For instance, um, the bureaucrats in Brussels, in, in their infinite wisdom, have decreed that no pipeline can be used uh, more than half for more than half of its capacity by any given uh, natural gas supplier. So, um, uh, when it comes to all of the pipelines supplying um, supplying Europe, um, you're talking about Gazprom for fifty percent of it and Gazprom for the other 50% of it, and there are no other choices. Um, so they just basically cut their consumption in half. And um, that, that's just one example of uh, in, just incredibly stupid behavior. Another example of incredibly stupid behavior is they said that uh, long-term agreements, natural gas uh, agreements, are uh, contrary to the free market atmosphere that they like to cultivate. So it's all going to be based on spot pricing. And uh, that causes gas, because otherwise Gazprom has uh, the ability to introduce monopoly pricing and that's bad. And, and so Gazprom says, okay, uh, you want spot pricing? 
let's see how high we can goose up the gas, the price of natural gas now. And they turn the valve, wait for the, for the price to go up until they like it, and then they turn the gas back on. And they can do it as many times as it takes to get the price they want. So they just got handed the mechanism they need to institute monopolistic pricing um, using the most free market system imaginable. There's a lot of stupidity like that. Uh, so I, I would say that, you know, uh, energy sh the energy shortage, um, uh, actually it's free and cheap energy shortage, um, you know, the days when British Petroleum could just steal all of Iran's oil, you know, those days are gone. Um, so now everybody has to pay for it. Uh, that's part of the problem, but the other part of the problem is suicidal stupidity. And so uh, what do you think it will manifest as, like the Four Horsemen? Do you see things, for example, like America going to war with China? Well, I think that or, a lot of... what is it? Well, I think it's going to, to, to be a marginalization of various countries economically. Um, uh, basically, the, the standard of living depends on the standard of industrial production, uh, level of industrialization, level of technological development. Level of technological development depends on the competitiveness of, competitiveness of any given region. Uh, in order to be competitive, it has to have access to uh, secure, reliable, and cheap electricity more than anything else. If, if you make electricity too expensive, industry dies. Um, and um, in turn, uh, an area that was previously developed, such as the Ukraine, for instance, uh, that once it is deprived of access to uh, cheap and free energy, reverts to uh, some kind of a semi-agrarian er area that rapidly depopulates, which is in fact happening. The Ukraine has lost something like a third of its population during its uh, three decades of independence. Similar things happened in Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania. It's not happening in Belarus because Belarus has an umbilical cord tying it to Russia. Uh, but this is, this is going to be the pattern throughout Eastern Europe. In fact, it already is. And that line will move further and further west. Um, it, it's also happening in, you know, in Great Britain, uh, where industrial production is, is uh, uh, going to become extinct in a not too distant future, mostly having to do with uh, energy policies. Um, and, and so what you'll have uh, then left over if everything stays peaceful is these, these sort of uh, ethnic theme park nature preserves where everything is highly ecological, but everybody is pretty much very poor uh, and, uh, and, and not having too many options. And lots of people try to leave and, and uh, try to, uh, to somehow infiltrate one of the few remaining zones of, uh, of industrial activity. So this is the exact opposite to the oligarchs view. So if you take Klaus Schwab and the Great Reset, their idea seems to be that, you know, the machines make the machines that make the machines and everything's highly automated. And so everybody is kind of surplus population, really. Um, now, you don't think much of the Great Reset. You don't think it will actually turn into, into anything. And you've said before, I think, that it's basically the oligarchic version of a um, suicide, uh, it's kind well, of a suicide pact. Well, right? look, so, I think so. I'm, I'm kind of petrified of the Great Reset and <laughs> the WF. Uh, so, can you explain why you think it's going to not going to amount to much? Well, look, uh, Klaus Schwab is is pretty much a, a money bag whisperer. There is there is such a thing, um, such a position in life. You know, he's 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 been. Uh, the head of that organization forever. And he's basically a, a fluffer for the super rich. Now, um, the thing you have to understand about the super rich is that uh, they're not the super smart. They're just the super rich. And uh, there's a, a thing about being very rich um, that I've noticed. Uh, it, it causes very various uh, uh, parts of, 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 the, of the human uh, to atrophy. 
yeah, logic is replaced with something I called money bag logic. It's it's really quite different from uh, you know any kind of common sense. And and so these people who are just full of themselves and uh, driven by greed and fear uh, get together and they have this fluffer come out and fluff up their egos. Uh, what does that add up to? Um, well, you know, there was a, a, this uh, uh, confab, Davos virtual confab, uh, where they talk to themselves uh, as they usually do. But then uh, they decided, well, our great global plan for making, uh, making use of the coronavirus pandemic to bamboozle everyone isn't going to happen unless Russia and China come along. And so they invited uh, Xi Jinping and, and Vladimir Putin to come and, and speak, address them. And what a shock it was that both of them basically said that, uh, basically we have our own plan for, uh, for a global reset and you can come along with it if you like, but you, we won't come along with yours. And uh, so that was a bit of a shock for them and they instantly signed up with, for, for uh, uh, one on one, -on -one or, or, you know, closed door consultations on how they could possibly get in and what Russia and China are going to be doing. Because clearly what, what, uh, what the Davos crowd is trying to do is going to be a flop given that Russia and China have their own different plan that doesn't depend on them. Thank you, that's very interesting. So at this point of view from <clears throat> from the east because we're a little bit we're a little bit in our western echo chamber and we were trying to open the dialogue with people from the east from russia but also india china it's difficult because yeah this is this is a very interesting uh, point of view on the reception of davos by china and russia thank you for that i i was totally ignored on those matters So what uh, what do you think Putin uh, went to? I mean, Biden went to talk to Putin about. Do you have any idea now, or is it still unknown? Well, it's it's something that you cannot possibly mention in the United States without being attacked by just about everybody. But uh, I'm one of those people who doesn't mind. I guess so. I will say it. Um, Biden, Biden went to Geneva to negotiate the terms of surrender. Um, it's, it's not going to go particularly well for the United States. Uh, basically, they're in the mode where they're, they're trying to push off the inevitable a month, maybe a few months at a time. Um, basically, they're going to face a bout of hyperinflation, uh, a drop in the living standards mm -hmm. of the average American by a factor of 10, uh, and, and basically unrest and civil war um, in their midst. And uh, there, it's going to be a rout. They're going to be forced to repatriate everyone from all of their different uh, military bases around the world and pretty much abandon them. Um, who knows who, what, these, what these troops, once they're repatriated into a civil war environment full of uh, loose weapons are going to do with their spare time. Um, so it's not going to be a very pleasant atmosphere. So what Biden really wanted was, first of all, to have Putin say that, yes, Biden is the president of the United States, even though half of the Americans don't think so, because Americans tend to have a, a, a rather positive of, uh, you know, not necessarily in the sense of, uh, hey, we like him, but, you know, they take them seriously. They, I think most Americans realize that uh, Putin is the real deal, whereas their leaders are sort of not leaders. Um, and, and so one of those, one of the elements was to basically legitimize his reign, no matter how tentative it is. Another was to uh, ask Rus Russia to please be gentle with them, for instance, to put some brakes on, on Putin's plan to stop selling energy for uh, for U.S. dollars, to to um, to keep at least keep the fiction alive for a little longer that the U.S. dollar is still the world's reserve currency that everybody has to use. 
Um, and then the, the military stand down. Basically, Russia has weapons that uh, uh, will, in, an, in the event of a war, make it impossible for the Americans to resupply their troops in Europe. Basically, anything that tries to sail in to Europe from the United States carrying any, any war material will be sunk uh, before, it, well before it reaches the shores of Europe. Uh, and now that that's the case, um, there's no reason to even try. So all of these war games that uh, you know the United States and NATO are performing, uh, that's strictly for internal com consumption and for propaganda purposes and to keep the military contractors happy because military contractors in the U.S. have incredible political clout. They're not to be ignored or displeased. Um, and, and, and so that Biden went to Geneva to basically say, look, okay, we fold, uh, but, but please be nice to us because, uh, you know, you, you'll, you, otherwise you'll have a bigger mess on your hands than you will have bargained for. But uh, Russia and China are basically probably going to smell blood and go for the jugular, right? They're going to de-dollarize like there's no tomorrow and then have a victory dance on America's grave, aren't they? Mm. No, not really. Um, uh, Russia is, um, uh, the, 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 I guess, the, the third largest supply of oil to the United States. Basically, uh, the United States has all of, uh, all of this oil that it gets from itself and from Canada from fracking. It's, it's going to be a dwindling amount, but it's still significant. The problem with all of this fracked oil, other than the fact that it makes an incredible environmental mess and is very expensive, is that it's too light to make the useful kinds of uh, industrial fuels, which is uh, various brands of kerosene, jet fuel, uh, bunker fuel, diesel, etc. Uh, to do that, you, you have to mix it with some uh, heavier stuff. Uh, before that heavier stuff uh, came from Venezuela, but we all know how well the plan to overthrow Nicolas Maduro went. And so now um, uh, Venezuelan oil uh, is not going to the United States. Instead, um, the United States has become completely hooked on this uh, Soviet-era substance called mazut-100, which is a, a heavy grade of oil, uh, basically not very highly refined crude oil. And uh, if deprived of it, it would be unable to uh, keep its refineries going. And its transportation network, which is all based on, 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 on uh, diesel and, and jet fuel, would grind to a halt. And uh, so that to avoid that, they have to keep relations with Russia very cordial and uh, hopefully negotiate a deal where they don't have to part with something they don't have like gold in order to, in order to buy it. So America doesn't then have the ability to wage war uh, because basically there would be a, an oil embargo and they couldn't get around that. So does China get Taiwan out of this? I mean, that's the negotiating chip of demand if America's in this position, won't it? Well, again, if you look at the structure of the Chinese economy, it's, it's so intertwined with the Taiwanese economy that a bull in a China shop approach to Taiwan would not really go over very well anywhere. And um, so this is really uh, uh, a, a, a long-term process to, to kind of uh, separate, gently separate Taiwan politically from, from the United States and, and uh, attach it uh, politically to mainland China. But this is a long term, this is a long term policy. And in the meantime, uh, you just basically never, never talk about Taiwan as, as a separate entity uh, in order not to ruffle Chinese feathers. If you're smart, you just basically keep very quiet about it. So it would get kind of Hong Kong status and then softly 
itself be, be integrated just like Hong Kong? I don't I don't know that it'll get Hong Kong status. Um, that that was a peculiar peculiar arrangement having to do with uh, the remnants of the British Empire. Mm -hmm. Taiwan, so you, know, you don't see. Sorry, Taiwan is a, a different story. It's it's Chinese nationalists, which the communists defeated. Uh, so uh, it's it's a sort of uh, you know postponed denazification that has to happen there politically, in order to uh, get Taiwan acceptably Chinese. And so you don't see a conflict coming in the South China Sea. Well, no, because, well, how, how would it go? Uh, so far, um, Americans just kind of sail through there uh, and try not to soil their diapers while doing so. Uh, what are they going to do? Start shooting? You know, that's a ridiculous notion. Yeah, imagine a kind of proxy war. Um, you know, I mean, certainly there's scope in the Malacca Straits and things like that to and around Australia to start a kind of a proxy war, like, you know, I assume it's like Cold War II, and it would be like one of the many proxy wars around. And there certainly would be a proxy war in Africa. Um, there's a lot of opportunity for that from Mozambique to Ethiopia and Egypt now. Well, yes, there will probably be some proxy wars in Africa. There, there usually are. Uh, there, there are probably two or three going at any given time. Uh, should we worry about that? I don't know. <clears throat> we mostly well, the, the dangerous escalation, right? Sorry. Yeah, go ahead. It's, it's okay, go ahead. I was, going to, I was going to ask a question about cyber wars, but we can talk about that later on. That's far more serious. Oh, yeah, yes. yeah, we should. Okay. Yeah, that, well, that's what I was kind of going to say is the dangerous escalation and, uh, you know, all the nuclear accidents and things that happened during the Cold War that only came out later. But the, I mean, there's so many more fronts that uh, can be used nowadays, the NBC front and the cyber warfare front. So uh, as uh, proxy wars are not only on the ground and hot wars. I mean, this, they've been waging economic war and cyber warfare for a long time now. So there's a whole new way of waging war so what do you think about that? Could there be that kind of Cold War? Well, yes, and it's, it's ongoing and it's wonderful. Uh, basically, uh, the people in the West have become uh, top-notch boomerang makers. Everything they do just hits them upside the head. And of course, they're so full of themselves mm -hmm. that they pretend that that was just as it, they intended uh, and just uh, blissfully go on to craft the next boomerang. Uh, if you look at just about everything they've done, for instance, in terms of uh, anti-Russian sanctions, uh, for instance, just pull an example, um, they uh, decided to thwart Russia in developing its uh, domestic uh, aircraft industry, passenger aircraft industry, uh, by uh, banning the uh, export to Russia of uh, uh, the materials needed to make composite wings, carbon fiber. Well, it took Russia a couple of years, but now they make their own carbon fiber. They're going to export carbon fiber to the rest of the world. Uh, they uh, have built enough uh, aircraft with kyber, carbon fiber wings in the meantime to basically take over uh, uh, at least half of the, the domestic uh, uh, air transportation, passenger trans transportation market. It's going to be a hot export commodity. In the meantime, Bo Boeing has more and more trouble and has uh, been unable to solve its technical problems, which it had previously solved with the help of Russian engineers who are no longer available. And, and so that's an example of a wonderful boomerang. Um, there, there are countless others. Um, and 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 uh, each time, uh, the basically the attitude is the same. Oh, we'll block them from doing this, that, and the other thing. And then the the reaction on on the other side is, oh, what a wonderful opportunity to get rid of these nasty Western suppliers, who mm -hmm. who are uh, liable to block us at any given time. 
uh, and let's just invest in, in, in our own production and, and, and catch up and, and turn it into an export industry. And that's what they do every time. Yeah, that's uh, exactly what happened in South Africa. They never learned. The arms embargo just created an arms industry that was eventually exporting to all these countries around the world as if uh, something else was going to happen. But um, yeah, so, okay. So, uh, Sophie, do you want to ask any more questions about about this political arena and the Cold War kind of stuff? Because I, know, I wanted to ask you... I'm okay. Go ahead. Yeah, I wanted to change tack a bit. And one of the things I haven't really been clear on is um, you seem to be quite an orthodox Christian. Is is that a correct read or, or what What do you actually believe? What's your religion and what, well, what, what's your philosophy on like atheism and stuff? Oh, well, uh, I don't really have a philosophy on atheism. I do have a, 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 a philosophy on faith, which is that it's it's optional. Uh, faith is a, a gift that is uh, most freely given to simple people, whereas the highly educated people tend to have their heads full of all sorts of uh, fancy notions that preclude them from um, for instance, believing in miracles. Um, you know, the faith is uh, something that children uh, adopt very, very easily. And then as they grow up and are exposed to uh, all manner of, uh, uh, you know, highly evolved ideas, they tend, their, 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 their faith tends to disappear, uh, pretty much never to come back. But the thing about faith is, okay, well, uh, it, it's, it makes life a little bit simpler because whether you believe or not, you're bound by the same laws and rules. Uh, you don't you don't have to believe in the rules in order to follow them, but follow them you must. Uh, these rules have evolved over millennia, and and have uh, uh, basically formed part of what it means to be human. And if you get rid of them, you stop being human, and that's not a good thing. But is it religion or is it actually faith? Uh, because I think you can practice religion and get all the benefits of it, kind of like a placebo. You know, a few years back, they used to think placebos were a trick and they tricked people into, you know, basically um, uh, auto-suggesting them into health. And then they recently discovered that you can tell people it's a placebo. It doesn't affect the placebo effect at all. And I think religion is like that too. You can go to church and practice religion, but be a complete atheist and you get the benefits of, you know, the social structures. I'm sure you you appreciate the Russian Orthodox Church. Like, I mean, I'm here in Greece and the, the Greek Orthodox Church, I, I've been impressed with how much uh, social cohesion it offers. So is it is it really faith that matters or just the practice of religion? I think neither. I think basically there there is a, a core sense that religions, uh, you know, good religions. I don't mean devil worship. Uh, good religions inculcate in people that that make them uh, a lot better as people, and that is almost universal. So it doesn't matter what, whether but someone what goes to church to? or not. It doesn't matter whether what, uh, one is part of a congregation. It doesn't. It, none of those things really matter. It it is really a question of what is someone what is in someone's heart, what is in their soul. But what about the abuse of religion? I mean, since you know the Crusades and since Constantine, there's you know basically your religion has been abused to oppress people. But, the state has used it for control. It's kind of a medieval surveillance state. Well, what has the state has not abused? Why single out religion? Yeah, but I mean, we're, right, but I mean, we wouldn't have even heard of Christianity if it wasn't for Constantine's abuse of St. Paul's cult, really. So, it, you know, it's basically religion is part and parcel of the state. 
faith is something which goes back to the dawn of history. We can't trace it back to shamanic times and, and further. But organized religion is, seems to be the handmaiden of the state. Uh, you know, it's not an accident that the state abuses it. It's part of the state. It depends on what religion and what state. Uh, so uh, if, if you talk about uh, Catholicism and uh, uh, the fact that, uh, you know, all of the Western dynasties uh, legitimized themselves through the Vatican, then, well, yes, that is a, a clear intrusion of religion into civic life that shouldn't be allowed. Uh, but if you look at how the same thing went on, say, uh, you know, in what became the Russian Empire, that entire territory, there was a completely different pattern because uh, basically there was complete religious tolerance and Muslims and, 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 uh, and Christians, Orthodox Christians coexisted as they do now. Uh, and uh, civil authority had nothing to do with religion. The priests had no more capacity to affect the outcome of the the election of the leadership than they they do now. Even we, we, were in state, times, yeah. we were talking about the state in general, not states as single Russian American. The state as a as an entity, as a you see, mo most of us most of us in the group are at heart uh, anarchists. And we are not really, uh, you know, that, that explains my question, basically. Um, the, the, I think it's totally entwined. You can't, you can't separate the, 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 the state from organized religion. It, every example that you take, every country, every, and history, um, and colonization, everything. So uh, I, I don't see your example as, as being correct, even for the Russian Empire. Well, first of all, the state is uh, an absolute necessity. So uh, you, you can apply anarchic ideas at the level of a village where everybody knows everybody. And I've written extensively about that. Um, uh, I have a book called Communities That Abide that is all about that. Uh, the problem is that uh, it doesn't work at, uh, at, a, at a larger scale. And uh, if you don't have a structure, a political structure at a larger scale, um, you will have a war that will never end. It will be basically a genocidal conflict between different ethnic groups. You will never achieve peace because initially peace uh, can only be achieved through repressive means. Coercion to peace is a necessary step. And that can only be done by a powerful centralized government. Now, the problem with a powerful centralized government outside of uh, medieval Europe is that uh, it can't embrace one religion and, and uh, not embrace the others. So it, it can't say, well, you know, uh, we, we will impose our will through the application of Orthodox Christianity and uh, completely ignore the 25% who are Muslim. Uh, that just won't work. Um, and, and so you basically have uh, uh, even the most uh, repressive state uh, embrace religious tolerance. And that, that precludes uh, the, the development of any, any sort of authoritarian structure based on religion. Even in the Islamic world, you see it that way? I mean, uh, the Islamic caliphate is not known for religious tolerance. Well, the caliphate is fully paid for by the CIA and the State Department. It's an, a completely artificial bunch of wackos that have been organized for a purpose. Uh, there is no more caliphate. There are now uh, basically, a, you know, there, there, there are a few governments that, that are kind of religious in nature. Uh, Iran and Saudi Arabia are probably, you know, the prime suspects there. And then there are a bunch of uh, uh, authoritarian regimes, basically, which work well in the Arab world because there isn't really any kind of a basis for, for democracy. And a lot of these, uh, you know, are, are borderline failed states or candidates for failed statedom. 
Um, and it's it's uh, going to be quite interesting to see how many of them end up in, in, in the failed state column. Uh, Yemen is definitely there. Somalia is definitely there. Uh, Libya is definitely there. We'll have to, Syria has been borderline but rescued through concerted efforts by Russia. Um, we'll have to see which way Egypt goes. Uh, Egypt is, is not really in, in a, in a state in a stable condition um so there there are a lot of things to watch there uh but uh i i would say the the islamic world the you know these are the embers of the once great caliphate you know the dying embers uh who knows what will happen there i i would like to return to, uh, to the idea of of the state guardian of peace because i'm i'm kind of interested in history and i i i cannot understand your point of view about peace there and the state. I, I just get, don't get it. I, I, everywhere I look, I see the, the, uh, the opposite uh, results in terms of peace uh, at an individual, at a community, at a national level. I don't, I think the state and peace are opposite. Well, I, I think that, you know, yeah, this I is must, understandable. I, I agree with that. Yeah. I think this is understandable. I mean, back, back to Samaria, you, you see, you see armies and states coming together. I mean, the, the first thing a ruler does is raise an army so that they can get more income and taxation, right? Well, yes, because uh, you're, you're looking at it from an, an imperialist perspective, uh, from a culture that is imperialist through and through and views the entire world through an imperial, imperialist lens. Uh, lots of different things happened at different times. For instance, the colonization of Siberia that went on by Russia um, basically had to do with, uh, with quelling uh, inter-ethnic uh, conflicts between groups that continue to live on that same land that they've inhabited the entire time. Uh, before that, there was a, a, a constant struggle where the, the weaker ethnic groups were squeezed out further north uh, so that the, uh, the more powerful ethnic groups uh, could occupy the more fertile lands further south. And this went on for millennia. And uh, as the, the Russian Empire spread to the Pacific, it basically quelled all of this unrest by uh, having everyone obey a rather simple structure where everybody paid a little bit of tax and accepted administration posted from Moscow in exchange for peaceful coexistence. Uh, you know, this is dramatically different from what happened in the British Empire, which basically uh, resorted to genocide more times than, than we, can, we can remember. Uh, basically, it exterminated uh, countless ethnic groups all over the place uh, in order to extract as much uh, wealth from that land as possible to then abandon it. And uh, th that has been the pattern there. Um, so no grounds for comparison, but in terms of keeping the peace and coercion to peace, that is, uh, I would say, typically Russian know-how at this point. And it relies on a ra rather strong well-developed central state. So, yeah, there's the arguments for Pax Romana, so maybe a Pax Russo there as well, but it implies that Rome has to conquer everywhere first and the Tsar has to conquer everywhere first and then impose a peace with uh, taxation and loss of autonomy and freedom. Well, that's not how it went. First of all, Pax Romana is notorious for uh, depopulating entire uh, districts and laying waste to them. Uh, basically, it was a peace. Yeah, peace that kind of point. Yeah. Peace was that that was comparable to death, whereas the Russian Empire uh, was most remarkable for the fact that its fr that its fringes, uh, well, Moscow, and then its fringes were by far the most prosperous. Uh, that ha that pattern has persisted for pretty much the entire time. Uh, so in the late Soviet era, for instance, the Baltics and the Ukraine and Georgia were by far the most prosperous of the Soviet socialist republics with the highest standard of living. Uh, because uh, the rest of Russia, parts of it which were 
were quite poor, uh, basically subsidized them uh, because the the idea was that you 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 make Russia or the Soviet Union attractive enough so that everyone wants to join voluntarily because conquering is out of the question. So historically speaking, do you think that the communists were non-expansionist? That was just a, a Western myth? Of course they were expansionists. They wanted world revolution. It, it took Stalin to convince everyone that what we want to do first is build socialism in one separate country, which is the Soviet Union. And uh, a lot of um, a lot of hardcore Leninists went to the, the gulag for refusing to part with the notion of world revolution. Um, a lot of Trotskyites just basically had, had their, you know, the, their severed heads handed to them for refusing to abandon that notion. It was quite a struggle, but it ended, you know, it ended before World War II for all, for, for all intents and purposes. Could I, could I start the conversation? I've seen it an hour we've been talking and I see that we have some divergences on a lot of points, but that's fine. That's grand and it's wonderful to, to hear what you have to say, Dmitri. But uh, you have written extensively over uh, on collapse. And I was wondering if you hadn't any questions, uh, particularly from his point of view, who has lived through a collapse too, on, on what's happening at the moment in most of the world, I'd say, not just the Western world. Um, due to the environmental crisis, the economical crisis, all, all these sorts of things where we are just all quite collapse aware and probably rather doomer, uh, doomers to you from your point of view, Dmitri. But um, Hugh, would you launch a question there? Yeah, so, um, uh, so my ideas of, of collapse are really colored by my youth in South Africa and I feel that I'm kind of living through it all over again, something which I didn't quite expect. But it has the whole tenor of, you know, the, the prevailing zeitgeist now has the whole tenor of my youth in South Africa, particularly the denial of collapse, the conversations that I have are very, very close to the ones I used to have back in, in those days. So uh, people have a very distorted idea about collapse that may, mainly comes from Hollywood and it's very Mad Maxi kind of 12 year olds <laughs> wet dream of what a collapse is going to be. And so I try to explain to people, you know, it's color, it's just basic stuff. Like, you know, you just can't predict how things are going to, going to carry forward and things like you must concentrate on your psychology and building up social networks and not so much on packing guns and you know, tin food, <laughs> getting a bunker mentality. But you, you kind of uh, do that too, am I right? Well, basically, uh, most, most of, uh, most of what, what it takes to survive collapse doesn't depend on, uh, doesn't depend on, on what, what people, uh, how people prepare. You know, this, this is what people get wrong is they're, they're, either, they're either collapse ready or they're not. Uh, and that has a lot to do with how their society is structured and, and uh, how uh, their communities are structured and, and uh, what, what the laws are, what the basic, uh, uh, the basic uh, mores that, that de determine human interaction, what those are, uh, how much uh, ethnic solidarity they have with the people around them. Do they even have such a thing as ethnic solidarity, uh, or do they have uh, fancy notions of uh, pluralism and think that pluralism is a value in collapse? Um, those things are far more important, and that, that's what I was pointing out to begin with. One of the first things I, I came out with was uh, something jokingly called closing the collapse gap, which pointed out that uh, the Soviet Union was inadvertently very well prepared to survive collapse in the way that the United States very pointedly is not. And basically everything I wrote then in 2005 or six, I don't remember exactly one of those years, we see unfolding now in the United States. It's basically going according to my 
uh, worst case scenario. It's not even the worst case scenario yet. It's just a basically a nasty scenario. But basically, it's following that scenario. Basically, the United States is falling into a collapse gap of its own making and cannot do anything to change that because changing it would involve inventing a time machine, going back a century, and passing a whole bunch of very different laws. So you don't see a global collapse. You see it very specific to the Europe and America, North America. I think it's going to be very different in different places. Uh, I think we may see some fairly surprising developments even within Europe, uh, different countries going very much their own way, uh, making their own foreign policy and, and links with countries perhaps halfway across the world. Um, and then uh, what, I, what I really see failing uh, catastrophically is the entire globalist uh, framework as a whole. I think that basically people who pursue this one world agenda uh, are basically going to be wearing egg on their faces before too long. I think you have talked and yeah. you've been in contact with French, uh, with a French uh, guy called Pablo Servigne, and you have actually your book um, collapse translated uh, in French after your several interventions with his group on what they call collapsology. And um, I, I'm a bilingual, so I've, I've followed some of the French uh, uh, comments on your intervention and uh, I, I'm quite interested to see how they are looking at resilience and community and uh, and also spiritual preparation um, uh, very importantly spiritual preparation what is your take on that I really haven't kept up with him I'll, I'll have to uh, check into what he's been up to uh, but I, I, I at this point I don't know So how are we doing for time? Have you have you got a hard stop that you need no, to? No, not really. No, no, I can keep going. What time is it? Uh, oh, yeah, okay. No, yeah, what we have another we found half an hour. is that. Oh, great. Well, the, what we found is the long format conversations are most interesting because the mainstream media can only dive into things in a very superficial way, and they, they have to have sound bites and stuff. And what a lot of uh, people like everybody from Jordan Peterson on have been doing these long format videos because they get really interesting. You can kind of burn the first reel, the first hour, <laughs> and then they they start to go to really interesting places, and that's uh, I think they're getting quite popular for for that reason. So so we've had a good success with with that long format that you can do on YouTube and stuff now. So the longer you you can go if it's being interesting. Um, you know, it's it's really interesting to talk to you because the the Duma community, as you know, is kind of closed. It's a closed echo chamber. <laughs> we kind of stir the Duma turd an awful lot, and uh, it kind of goes nowhere. Um, so my thing is, I feel like although we are we don't have a lot of human agency as individuals, we can't really save the world. And I think you you think the same too, but I, I believe you should, you know, personally, an individual should do right action, just kind of, you know, this virtue ethics that just says, well, although it's hopeless and we, there's going to be a big or, or mighty crash, you should actually do something to, you know, try and help in some way. My particular concern is the environment, and so I'm an accelerationist, because I think the sooner the globalist agenda ends, the more that will be left afterwards. Um, so what's your take on, on that, on the doomosphere and accelerationism? I don't really have a take on it. I think that people are pretty much wasting their time thinking about this stuff, because there's nothing they can do about it. Um, I think that basically it's a, it's a distraction. Uh, if they really want to have a future uh, that somebody is going to like, uh, then they have to start by working with children. And to do that, you have to start having children, which a lot of people these days are avoiding doing because they think uh, that, well, the planet is overpopulated and, and uh, therefore we shouldn't even bother. Um, 
you know, that doesn't really work. The future is in a very direct sense, the children and what, what ideas and notions and, and skills we, we, we give them. And uh, in terms of uh, the environment, uh, it's really good to do stuff on the local level that makes the environment better. Just figuring out which trees to plant, you know, if, if you devote your time to that, you'll suddenly find that you don't have time to think about, you know, global climate calamities because your time has been eaten up by your selection of tree species. You know, that, that's that's just one example. But, you know, I think that a lot of this uh, thinking about, oh my God, the world is going to end, we'll all drown or bake or whatever, is is just really, strictly speaking, a waste of time. So you wrote um, about shrinking the technosphere. And I was wondering if, I certainly think that there's possibilities for activism in the technosphere and for shrinking the technosphere. Um, I, I was wondering, I just noticed that the, your book on Amazon, Shrinking the Technosphere, has actually advertised other people that got this also got Ted Kaczynski, which <laughs> Ted Kaczynski's latest book, which, which I thought was kind of interesting. Um, so I wondered, have you, have you read anything about Ted Kaczynski? Have you read any of the stuff? I mean, beyond the manifesto and stuff, but the, he wrote something called The Anti-Tech Revolution, The Why and the How. Well, which is pretty much about rapidly shrinking the technosphere. <laughs> well, I respect him uh, for his thinking, you know, not necessarily his methods, but uh, um, I actually quote him extensively in my book, Shrinking the Technosphere. There, there's half a chapter specifically on Ted, Ted Kaczynski. Um, I think that he was pretty brave for his time in terms of what he thought. I think that a lot of his thinking is, is spot on. Uh, in fact, his critique of uh, bourgeois democracy, I think, is, is just uh, extremely sharp and very penetrating. Um, the problem with him now is that, you know, he's living in complete isolation and, and is given a very large supply of, uh, of paper and pens. And so he spends all of his time scribbling with very little feedback. And so he tends to become very verbose and, and uh kind of hard to process. So, you know, that is the the unfortunate fact of him being locked up like that. Um, I don't I don't question, you know, the morality of, of his being locked up. He did do some crimes. Uh, but you know, it's unfortunate that a very bright person has been limited in this way. But his ideas about really rebelling against the technical revolution and particularly, well, what amounts to AI and all this kind of digital control. It's kind of barreling towards us. I mean, I see a nanny state that's run by you know, technology. Um, do you don't agree with the trying to rebel against it? Well, uh, I think the, the big problem is uh, corporate control. You know, that, that is by far the largest problem. I don't even see it as a state control of technology because the state can be benign. But cor corporations cannot be benign. Corporations are by their design psychopathic. And so if we have unlimited control of technology handed to, hey, who's that? That's a, that's a Tomcat? Oh, that's nice. In any case, the, that's your tongue. Talking. In any case, yeah. uh, uh, handing handing the keys to uh, these uh, psychopathic, profit-driven entities, uh, and basically having them mismanage all of society uh, to their heart's content, basically to 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 maximize their profits and and their shareholder revenue. Um, is absolutely horrible. And I see this uh, battle right now unfolding in Russia where Russia allows in uh, Facebook and, and Twitter and, and YouTube. And uh, then when it insists that uh, 
uh, videos uh, popularizing the notion of suicide among the youth or um, preaching uh, some kind of uh, gender dysmorphia as an agenda or um, uh, any of the other basically social illnesses that originate from the West when it tries to block them out, uh, it is uh, pretty much ignored. So then it resorts to choking bad width. And uh, the next step, of course, is what the Russians typically do is basically, uh, you know, cut off that revenue that is going to the West and, and fuel it to developing domestic technology. So I expect that in a couple of years, they'll be just like they are in China, much better alternatives to all of these Western platforms that are homegrown and Russian that don't have on any of these problems. So that is really the approach is for the, for the state to uh, uh, stomp on the heads of, of, uh, of corporations and get them to behave. And if they don't, basically just supplant them. So what do you think about the philanthropist billionaires? And the thing that I'm particularly worried about is what looks to be coming down the pipeline very shortly, and that's uh, geoengineering. So the growing signs that these vast geoengineering projects are going to start up soon, and I think it's massive hubris. Um, what do you think uh, on that score, and what do you think about the billionaire philanthropists and how they're weaponizing these these uh, foundations and um, you know like Bill and Melinda Gates and all of these guys. What do you think about that? Well, you know these megalomaniac dreams have been megalomaniacal dreams have been in circulation for a really long time. It's just a, like flying cars. Uh, what comes around goes around. Every uh, every dozen years or so, we have a new crop of flying cars that flop and, and then everybody forgets about them and then they, they introduce them again. Same thing with bioengineering. In terms of launching something into orbit that might affect the weather in Russia, well, Russia has these uh, new S-500 air defense systems that can very easily shoot these things uh, out of near Earth orbit. Um, you know, this uh, wouldn't be a problem. Uh, so that would be easily fixed. And I don't think too many investors would be eager to invest in something that the Russians say they're going to shoot down. But what about things like solar radiation management, which is just things like Scopex, which is really just balloons and, you know, seeding sulfates in the upper atmosphere and uh, marine cloud brightening and, you know, basically spraying from ships and stuff like that. But, um, would Russia oppose the, those kind of things or would they be neutral, do you think? I don't know. Um, I, I think that there would be hell to pay if it started affecting, say, harvests in Russia. Uh, I can really see where that would be a, a, a conflict that would not end well for those people who are doing it on a number of levels. They're, they're, Russia has infinite levers to pull to, to uh, sanction individuals and groups. And uh, mm. uh, it just, I don't think it would fly. It wouldn't, it wouldn't, it, it wouldn't get off the ground. China is using it already. And they wouldn't, yeah, weather modification, yeah, for silver iodide and stuff, yeah. Well, Russia uses yeah. weather modification anytime there's a big game, you know, they, they chase the clouds away. They've been doing that for ages. Yeah, China too. In the at the Olympics, they uh, they seeded the the clouds and stuff to, mm -hmm. to get a better weather for the Olympics. Yeah, no, that's, um, that's old technology. But so so you don't think that Russia is on board with a climate change modification program that's designed to stop global warming? Well, look. Um, from the Russian point of view, none of this quote unquote science is provable. It's, it's all just projections. Um, and uh, they, they think that the reason this effort is on is uh, because the West has run out of things to tax and now wants to tax the air that people breathe all over the world. 
There is no way that they're going to achieve this because A, they're running out of time and B, the world knows that they're up to it. So this is basically people in the West talking to themselves. But th there are some uh, programs which are geoengineering, although they pretend they land management. They, that's a code um, through through a lot of countries, and especially in the high Arctic in Canada and stuff, is to call it land management. So the the uh, have you heard of uh, Pleistocene Park? It's an experiment up in Siberia, where they're trying to restore the ecology to something like the Pleistocene um, era. Well, sounds nice. You know, I'd, uh, more power to them. Why, why wouldn't they want to do that? If they have the money to throw at, at well, a project like that, seems like a fine experiment. Yeah, they 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 have unlimited money by the <laughs> look of things. Um, but uh, yeah, they. I think that once the the stuff is proven with things like the Gates Foundation, um, then they will fund it. Through through things um, like selling bonds and basically go to the financial markets and then rely on government subsidies through the taxpayer um, to to fund it. But they surprisingly cheap. I think the the Scopex program was they David Keith, who's one of the scientists behind it, he estimates that it's about two billion a year. So it's kind of pocket trading. Um, so I, I I can see them uh, I can see them doing it any day. Um, at least within the next five years or so. Oh, I don't know. I, I could also see uh, Bill Gates uh, basically shacking up with what's his name, the uh, the the Hollywood harp, uh, the Hollywood tycoon Harvey Weinstein. They could be bunk mates any day now. All all one has to do is <laughs> yeah. uh, you or know, Jeffrey up Epstein some is, all, is all from Jeffrey Epstein. Yeah. Jeffrey Epstein is his buddy too. <laughs> uh -huh. No, it's a, basically the, the compromising evidence on Bill Gates is voluminous. And so if, if somebody yeah. doesn't like what he's doing, um, it's all over for him. So do you, do you think groups like Extinction Rebellion and Fridays for Future and, and Greta, and that, they, they're just completely wasting their time or are they being used as a front or both oh it's it's absolutely ridiculous but kind of cute you know that's its redeeming virtue is that it's kind of cute um but greta is is basically a, a, a highly trained imbecile you know that's pretty obvious just looking at her she's just reciting her lines she's completely astroturf artificial person yeah, do, do you know Cory Morningstar and some of the work uh, the, the, about wrong kind of green? No. Uh, so yeah, she's she is quite well known for unpacking Greta, and uh, one of the articles was the manufacturing of Greta for consent, mm -hmm. and she kind of exposed the whole Greta phenomena of how it, it's essentially a. Swedish billionaire, I can't remember what his name is, that you know made her out of whole cloth and, you know, and then put her back in the cupboard after after last year. So um, yeah, it's very very interesting on that that side um, about. Uh, so yeah, Derek Jensen wrote a, a foreword to one of your books, um, and so I was I was wondering, have you kept up with uh, Derek and we, we interviewed Derek Lear, Keith, and Max Wilbert. Um, they came out with a book called Bright Green Lies, which is also on the topic about how bright greens uh, have hijacked really environmentalism and turned it into this great big uh, lobbying group for subsidizing green tech, basically, which uh, was not what the tree huggers were all about a few decades ago. Um, have you kept up with that? And have you read uh, Bright Green Lies or seen any of that? No, not really. I mean, it, it's it's strange to me to think that Greta requires book length tre treatment uh, of any sort. Um, as far as uh, uh, what's happening with quote unquote environmentalism, for instance, with 
quote unquote green energy, you know, solar panels and wind generators. Um, it's, it's really, um, it, it seems to me, it's one of those boomerangs. It's, it's an underhanded way to enhance Gazprom revenues because the more solar and wind you build, the more uh, natural gas-based generating capacity you will require in order to keep the grid from failing. And, and so it's, it's just a, a remarkably, uh, remarkably bad way to give lots of money to Gazprom uh, while paying sky high electric rates. That's all that achieves. Um, and, and so people can crit critique it on, on other counts, but I think that is the, that, that is the, the dead, the deadliest criticism of all the most damning criticism. And that's the thing to, to really pay attention to, uh, not, not these, you know, uh, side topics. So you don't hear much about Russia doing wind farms and um, solar energy and stuff like that. It's, uh, it, it, and that's correct, isn't it? There's not much going on. Well, Russia's um, approach to dealing with uh, rank idiocy uh, in, in foreign <laughs> countries is to cultivate a few rank idiots of its own. It's sort of like, oh, look, they grew a noxious weed. Uh, let's grow some too. And that's a typically Russian attitude. So yes, there are some solar panels and wind farms in Russia. In fact, the Russians have figured out that there are places in, in Russia, communities, where it's cheaper to build wind and solar installations than, than, than to, uh, to, uh, to, to, to transport coal to those locations because uh, there, there's no way to, uh, to build uh, railway links uh, to them economically. Uh, it's, you can you can ship in some wind turbines and solar panels by barge, or or uh, truck them in on on river ice when the 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 river is frozen, and then basically that that uh, uh, little community has much less d need for the diesel generator, uh, saving money on diesel. So that's the level on which this this uh, this green tech uh, can work in Russia. Uh, there have also been some efforts to uh, do what they're basically doing in Europe and Australia and other places, which is build a bunch of uh, wind and solar installations and require people to use them, even if this means uh, basically wasting energy uh, because you're, you're idling generating capacity that is being kept on hot standby the entire time because uh, wind and solar are so variable. And, and so I don't think that the Russians are going to be doing too much of that. Again, this is a way for Russia to basically uh, build a microcosm of global insanity in order to better understand it. Thank you for so that. So they're not uh, big subsidies. That insight yeah. into, into, into Russian thinking. <laughs> it's I, I got a glimpse of that in Russian literature. Yeah, and yeah. and I, I'm happy to hear that it's it's still going on. It's still going on. Yeah, you don't hear much of that, um, you know, in the Western media. <laughs> not very popular. Um, yeah, so they're not big Russian subsidies, and then they never will be. You, you don't think it's not like Germany, where they'll subsidize you to put, you know, basically water heaters and solar panels on your roof and things. Well. Um... I don't think it'll fly in Russia because there are these uh, building codes in Russia that apply to the entire land mass, which is something like one sixth of, of, the, of the world's dry surface with lots of uh, variation in climatic conditions. But pretty much everything built in Russia has to be rated to um, operate between the temperatures of, from minus 50 degrees C to plus 50 degrees C. And uh, so that makes uh, one's choice of technology rather restricted when it comes to, uh, to things that freeze up in the winter or, or burn up in the summer. 
and there's the problem of snow and stuff. So it's basically there are not many months of the year you can use solar, right, in most of Russia. Well, yes, there are about three, 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 four months out of the year where you get the maximum performance out of them. But it does make sense for certain things. For instance, um, suppose you uh, you have a place, an outpost somewhere that that has to uh, run a sawmill. Well, it can uh, run run that sawmill in the middle of summer, where it's, the days are endless, with solar panels that track the sun. That's that's a, an effective idea. And if the place is so remote that you know all it does is uh, cut up some wood and then float it out on barges, um, you know this might be a good a good good solution for it. it. Might save it a lot of money. Yeah, but. Um... We're only talking about a tiny fraction, a small percentage of the electricity budget of the country, right? Oh, yes, this is entirely niche. In terms of uh, Russia being just completely uh, uh, green um, in, in terms of its uh, quote unquote carbon footprint, uh, it, basically it's, it's going um, all in on closed cycle nuclear. So basically, it's going to be mm. running things on depleted uranium for thousands of years, uh, not emitting any gar carbon at all. Uh, it's moving on to second mm. generation fast breeder reactors right now. Um, and uh, it's reprocessing a lot of the nu high level nuclear waste uh, that it buys from other countries. Uh, so it's really going to be, it, it already is the uh, nuclear technology hub for the whole planet. Um, it, it has, it owes, owns three quarters of the nuclear reactor portfolio in the world, uh, Ross Atom does. Mm -hmm. So that's going to be the future. Uh, basically, there's a hundred year plan or so for Russia to wean itself from, nu from fossil fuels and replace them with nuclear. To do that, it has to build, ramp, ramp up to building probably around uh, 10 nuclear reactors a year. But what is the what is so, the process of recycling? What is what? Waste? You mentioned you mentioned recycling nuclear waste. Uh, what yes. Is, what is the technology there? Uh, fast breeder reactors can make plutonium out of depleted uranium, and in the process of doing that, they can also burn up all the high level nuclear waste down to low grade nuclear waste that can be safely buried. Safe, safely buried, which yes. is okay. You can't mix it into baby food or anything, but it's not <laughs> going to kill That's what I was thinking. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. It's not exactly Chernobyl quality, but yeah. So okay, so we, we're getting to close to the end of the uh, of uh, the, the time that uh, we specified. So um, I just got one more question, and that's. Um, the the alt right in America increasingly seems to be looking at Russia as kind of the last bastion of you know white supremacy and Christianity and how um, how is that received in Russia is it is it welcomed or is it <laughs> kind of like you know is it kind of poo poo well the the view from Russia is uh, you you have uh, um... Uh, a bunch of crazies in the West, uh, basically going on all in on on uh, climate catastrophism and gender dysphoria and various other nonsense issues. And then there are sane people in the West who look on that and they look around the world and look for some place that uh, is even a little bit like them. Uh, and uh, doesn't suffer from any of these problems. And they see Russia, and uh, they see Russia as increasingly attractive. Now, in terms of uh, white supremacism, Russia doesn't have any. Russians aren't really white, you know. Um, uh, I, that may come well, to a, sh a shock, right. people, but, <laughs> but, um, but, but they're not exactly one ethnic group. Um, and uh, that ethnic group is not necessarily white. Uh, in terms of supremacy, Russians are one of the most, or, or the most uh, prosecuted ethnic groups in the history of ethnic groups. 
If you look at the millions of Russians who died in the course of the 20th century and uh, World War II and then the collapse of uh, the Soviet Union, which was very much orchestrated from Washington, well, the aftermath was. Uh, and, and if you look at the results of disunity, you know, the, the Russians are uh, the ethnic group with, uh, with the most borders separating them. Uh, they're, they're scattered all over the world. Um, you can't really say that, you know, white supremacy has a home in, in Russia. It is really quite the opposite. The Russians are basically victims of, of uh, uh, Western instituted genocide. You have to recall that Hitler didn't come to Russia on his own. There were Italian troops, Norwegian troops, there were, uh, Romanian troops. Basically, it was an, a pan-European effort. Um, and, and the Russians did all of the heavy lifting to eradicate it from Europe, er eradicate fascism from Europe, um, with the Americans and the Brits joining in at the very end when they could see the outcome, just to grab a bit for themselves. And so, yeah, no, the, 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 the whole um, Russians are white supremacists thing just doesn't fly, doesn't fly at all. Well, yeah, so thanks a lot. Um, it's been greatly elucidating on the situation in, uh, um, in Russia, particularly. So I really enjoyed talking to you. And so well, thank you. Uh, do you have any questions? Do you have any questions for us? Or? Uh, no, not really. No, I, I enjoyed the conversation. And thank you for taking the time to listen. I think one of the reasons I'm still well, on the air uh, you know, that I haven't been quote unquote canceled is that I tend to be long winded and, and speak in sentences and paragraphs. And the people doing the censoring don't have the attention span to process that sort of thing. So I'm just completely ignored. And, and I, I suppose I yeah, like we, it that way because the alternative is even worse. Yeah, we, we, um, we've kind of weaponized that and used it as a tactic uh, for ourselves because uh, particularly if you talk about the pandemic, uh, YouTube will give you a strike straight away because they, they're scanning the words for keywords. Mm -hmm. um, but obviously they have to get some human eyes on it and you assume there's some guy in India who has to watch the whole thing. So that, there's a lot of protection in making a long format video because mm -hmm. you know he can only you know watch a few little cuts out of it <laughs> and it's very unlikely that you'll get to the meat and potatoes of it. So yeah, we did, definitely found this protection in it. Did you hear an ominous whoosh sound when you said pandemic? I did. <laughs> oh yeah, you you will if you stream on YouTube. We we've had some where we've been, yeah. We while we are talking, uh, you just say one keyword and bam, uh, basically they lose the stream straight away. Mm -hmm. So and, and it's you know multiple streams going, so you know that it's not coincidence. But it's 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 ridiculous the censorship going on. But hopefully we won't get um, we won't get. Uh, a hit on this one on YouTube. All right. Well, but fingers, thank you so much. It's crossed. been really a pleasure to talk. Okay. To you. Nice to talk to you. you. Take care. Take care. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. 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 I'll stop the recording now. Um, stop recording. <laughs>